um when when i get into these uh, discussions and i you know people ask about like what the greatest alan moore comic is a lot of the superhero fans will always point to watchmen but like the alan moore fans who are not necessarily superhero fans they have one answer they always have one answer i'm sure you can guess what that is because i'm talking to you <laughs> It's, it's from hell it's always from hell yeah all right are you, no, are you... i drew it i think it's a load of rubbish you know? <laughs> welcome to the comics cube everyone today i'm with a man who has won every possible award in the comic book industry the eisner the harvey the ignats the ink pot and the the eagle and the UK Comic Award, uh, Mr. Eddie Campbell. Hi, hey, Jose. Lovely to meet you. Lovely, lovely to be. You. Lovely to be here. I'd love to be in the Philippines, though. That that looks that looks warmer over there. It is. I, I bet it's bloody hot, actually. I bet you're in that. You're in the height of summer there, aren't you? No. Well, it's always it's always summer there. Uh, it's supposed to be rainy season, but it hasn't been raining so much. Cold enough that I don't need to turn my fans on all the time, though, which is nice. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah, that's cold for us. <laughs> um, you started working in comics uh, over 40 years ago. And uh, I was wondering uh, what drew you to comics? What was, the, what, was the, what was the spark for you? What drew me to comics? No um, pun intended. Um, well, at first, I want, when I was young, I wanted to be a cowboy. See, a lot of people in our milieu, they wanted to be astronauts or something. But I never read science fiction. I, I just couldn't get into it. Hmm. I wanted to be a cowboy. Really? And, uh, I wanted to be John Wayne. I wanted to be a specific cowboy. But sometime after that, I've, I've told this somewhere else, I think. But somewhere after that, I was, I was reading, I was reading a comic, because always kids read comics. You know, you, you don't say, what made you read comics. It would be more astonishing to meet somebody who never read a comic. I have met people who are so well brought up, they'd never read a comic, mm -hmm. and they look at comics and they say, uh, I don't know, I don't know what what to do. Do I read the words or the or the pictures? Imagine being so well brought up that you'd never read a comic. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be something? But anyway. I Are those people from like, from like areas with just no comic distribution or it's just, they're, they're just so well brought up that their parents never gave them a comic. Yeah. I have met people like that. It's insane. Um, <laughs> I was looking at one of my comics once. It was, it was an English reprint of, of a Marvel comic. And, and there were a couple of little names scribbled on it. And I thought, I thought some bastard had scribbled on my comic. You know, I thought somebody would get into my bag at school and scribbled on my comic. You know, I was, I was going to get, I was going to get this bastard. I'm going to kick him. It, it, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Two guys had scribbled in the, down in the bottom corner of, of the first story in this comic. And I was, and then I looked closely and I thought, you know, I kind of rubbed it a bit and I realized it was, it was part of the printing. And I thought, what do people make these? It, you know, I'm not, I was about five or six, I, just, I don't know, five or six or something, I, seven, whatever, eight, I can't remember. But I thought it was a window into, into a world where things were happening. I didn't think that somebody drew it. You know, you, you know, you're, you, there's an age yeah. when you're so young that it didn't occur to you that somebody draws these things. You, you thought they just happened. You thought a comic made it's itself. It's true. It's true. I have an older brother, so I always knew somebody drew these things, but it never occurred to me somebody was writing these things. Yes. No, but that is true. They write themselves. But, but somebody has to draw. Somebody has to draw. But somebody has to draw them. And from that moment on, I thought, I want to be one of these people. I want to be, I, 
not just one of these people. I wanted to be Jack Kirby. I want to actually be Jack Kirby and draw the, the, the Incredible Hulk in, in black and white, in, in English comics. I didn't realize yet they came from America. I didn't, I didn't understand what that was about. I thought only cowboys came from America. I didn't, I didn't realize it. It all happened very quickly. I, I came to realize it very quickly. Around about the time I was working for Marvel Comics because in my head, I was working for Marvel Comics. I never wanted to work for Mar Marvel Comics. It never occurred to me that I, I wasn't working for them. When, when, I, when I drew my versions of, of the Incredible Hulk and Captain America and so on, I thought that, uh, I, I thought I was on the payroll. I thought I'll just, I thought I'll just, I'll finish this one up and deliver and deliver it and then <laughs> start, so, start on the next one. I'll, 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 I'll tell them I want to switch over to Daredevil because I kind of like the way that's going. I'll see, if, I'll see if I can switch over to another title. Because yeah, really I know instead. Or... Yeah, because I know. Yeah. And once you start notice the names, you notice they start turning up on different. Yeah, it's not just like um, Doctor Doom or the Submariner is guest starring in different comics, but. The same artists are guests. The, the artists are moving around as well. In fact, that interested me much more than the characters. Mm -hmm. I always, from a very early age, very early age, was more interested in what the artist was doing than what the characters were doing. In fact, I find it very. I've always found it very odd that my my contemporaries they seem to care too much about the characters. You know, I, I said, yeah, but there's. A, they're just made up, you know. That, that the Hulk's is made up. He doesn't really exist, you know. You know. But this guy here, this guy Jack Kirby, he's he's real. He's the real thing. He's the guy we've got to watch because he's real. He's or at least he's more real than the Hulk. You know. He could have been made up for all I for all I knew, but I I thought he was real. I I believed it intensely. Some if people would say. That it yeah. was a that Jack Kirby was a fiction. My whole world will come crashing down. I've built my life around around this belief that Jack Kirby was a real person. Some people would say Jack Kirby has taken on mythological status. This is true. Yeah, uh, that's interesting to me because uh, you were you were born in uh, 1955, so you were but just at the prime favorite, age for the Marvel. My favorite movie. line in one of my Beckett's comics is um, is. <laughs> The, the eyeball kid after he's just killed Hermes mm -hmm. he says uh, you used to be mythical now you're history <laughs> I see that <laughs> um, so you were the perfect age for it to hit you right the Marvel age that was the perfect age um, yes. yeah I was born in 55 so so I was you know, I was six or seven when they were doing the monster comics and eight. Well, when they, didn't he start the Hulk in eight sixty three? That would make me eight. I was reading the first yeah. Hulk stories. They were reprinted. Sixty two or sixty three? Yeah. They were reprinted in England pretty quickly. Sixty three, I think. Sixty three. Yeah. Uh, my generation, actually, subsequent generations who were not there at the start of the Marvel age, I notice a lot of us don't really get Kirby, even for me. Like um, when I first saw his work in the '80s, I thought, "Oh, this is this is ugly. This is unrealistic. This is this is weird." But then I grew to love him eventually. Some people well, never. Some people my age never do. Never they never get it. I you had a concept of realistic. My, I told you I have an older brother, <laughs> so he, <laughs> so he would plop down comics to me and be like, "This is realistic. This is not unrealistic. This is not realistic." You were briefed. I was like three yeah. years old. It took me a long time to get out of that too. So, yeah, uh, it took me a long time to get out of those preconceptions. Very strange. But did you, uh, it, for for those of us who never grow out okay. of that, would you? When want when comics were usually dull, it's because they were realistic. You know, um, Classics Illustrated or something was was. It wasn't so much realistic as as pedestrian <laughs> pedestrian, you know. Those I, kind of comics. Yeah, Classics Illustrated was always kind of a or bore. Christian <laughs> comics or something. <You> know? 
There was, there was if, if they if they if they were a bit as interesting as this Jack Kirby, you'd have been reading Christian comics or whatever. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, the interesting thing is, like, it you know, back then, if if you looked at the quote unquote realistic comics of the eighties. And then you look at some of the photorealism stuff that's being done now, you realize there's just a spectrum to realism too. It's just, yeah, it's yeah. not even, that's not, the stuff I thought was realistic. Wasn't even realistic. <laughs> yeah. Realistic was what was happening in the newspaper comics, like um, Carol day and the heart of Juliet Jones and those kind of comics, those uh, romantic comics which we were never interested in, of course. But, but um, I remember talking about Christian comics sometime in the 70s. It must be, it must be the, the rarest of all Marvel comics. They, they did a comic book, which was a biography of Pope John Paul. Mm, did you I've see heard that? about that. I've heard about and, that. And, and the artist who drew it was John Tartaglioni, who, who only ever inked. You know, he, he he inked over Gene Colin, he inked stuff, but he actually drew this. I've never seen it. I only know about it because my mother read about it and she said, Why don't why don't you do comics like this one, Eddie? Why don't you do <laughs> good religious <laughs> comics? Biography of the Pope. Yeah, I had one from like the eighties. It was a biography of Saint Francis of Assisi. I think it was drawn by John Busema. Yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah. Again, for those of us who never grow out of it, how would you how would you describe the appeal of somebody like Jack Kirby to to somebody like young me? I never thought about it. I've the I think Kirby's best work, by which I mean his mid sixties work, has has an, a nobility and, uh, and an elegance to it that, he, that his later work lacks. I didn't really enjoy the fourth world stuff. As that, is, that is a rare any, thing to hear from a Kirby yeah, fan. Or any of the stupid stuff that came after that. I mean, nothing after that. Fourth world was just about held my attention, but nothing that he did after that ever interested me. All of the, there was a, he had a, everything. It all became ugly. See, he's, he's work. He's work in the mid sixties. He he drew noble, upright men, and and um, and and ladies, attractive ladies. But but ten years later, everybody in his comics was ugly. Every everybody was actually ugly, and I I can't think of any way of describing it that would make it less ugly. I, I think his work in the 50s was wonderful. The, his work on the romance comics, yeah. uh, uh, the Young Love and uh, I forgot what the other one was called. He had, did he and Simon? Yeah, he had a few. Young Romance, that kind of stuff. Run, you know, run, yeah. Young Romance and Young Love. They put out two. They made a mint on those. Those sold huge numbers. And they got a good deal because it was the first romance comic and the publisher was a bit wary of it. So he let them have a profit sharing deal. And they, they left all the way to the bank on that one. But uh, I quite, but it's even the romance comics where, where other artists were doing the elegant photorealistic thing. Kirby's got those big blocky figures that uh, look like they're <laughs> they still look like they're carved out of gingerbread. These solid shapes. They, they're wonderful. Yeah. But 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 he, he observed all the niceties of uh, of um, body language and anatomy at that time. Late later on, I think it's because he overworked them. He, he worked. He, he churned out pages so fast that a lot of that fell by the wayside but his work on middle period uh, Thor is glorious yeah. I think that's my favorite work of his even um, 
and, and I, 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 I have said that uh, Vince Coletta is my favorite inker of the 1960s. And that, that's like um, blasphemy. That's blasphemy to Kirby fans. <laughs> I, I wrote it. I wrote a blog post yeah. about this about in 2006 or 2007 about how um, uh, Vince Coletta was my favorite inker, and they said you can't, you can't have him as your favorite inker because he he rubbed out Kirby's pencils, and I said, well, he rubbed out some of the figures, and, and I said. Well, the ones he rubbed out didn't influence me. It was the ones that he inked. They, they, they were a great influence on me. The other ones I never saw, so I don't, I don't know. They don't exist, so how could they influence me? I think I love his style. I love, they, Joe Sinnott on, on Fantastic Four had this glossy, shiny style. It looked like chromium, and it was right for science fiction. But Coletta was right for... Um, for for these scenes of Asgard, which are supposed to take place in a in a in a kind of medieval mythical place of swords and and kings and walking around in bearskin bearskin overcoats, <laughs> <laughs> he, he he had the textural detail for for fur and wood and yeah. And, and it, I love the richness of it, all that pen work. Well, you could see why I might prefer knowing knowing your my style, from, my from hell art work. You yeah. can see why I might prefer that to uh, the slick chromium look of Joe Sinnott, and even more so with some of the later Kirby inkers whose names I can't remember, like Mike Royer and yeah. Yeah. Royer. Yeah, that was actually my next question specific to your style you know mm -hmm. your very specific style uh very understated um in terms of you don't do the kirby um bass lines and bombastic uh foreshortening stuff a lot but you do have a lot of rendering and a lot of you know um, you 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 get posture from, really well well that was on from hell on from hell but i i don't draw that way on other things but um, yeah, body language. Body language, yeah. Figures. And, and I always like to draw all the figures in the panel. If there's a conversation going on over a page, I draw both figures in all the panels. And, and I draw them in middle distance where we can see them. I only put a big, I only put a close up in if, if we need to see the face for some reason. If we need to see the big face, that I find so much comic book art is just random. They they'll have ten, ten camera viewpoints on one scene. Why 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 was that camera moving around? Why is that camera moving around so much? What is it? Is it some fighters dance or something? Stand the camera in one place and let the people. Let your little inky figures act out the scene. You know, when I think of your style, when I think of your your gesture and body language and everything, you you mentioned from hell. But the the one page that I always come back to, the one page that sticks out in my mind when I think about, you know, Eddie Campbell and body language is actually the first page of the history of humor, where. Oh, right. It's just you talking to somebody and, and it's the same camera. You're basically seeing the full figure, but you're yeah. moving. I always thought yeah. that was that was fascinating. Yeah. Just the, the subtleties of, of 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 movements of angle of the head or the uh, or the wrist or the hand or the all the information is there. And it just bores me to tears when people are chopping it up and all the pictures are getting up in each other's business. Tell them to fucking sit down and mind their own business. Let each picture tell its part and let it be a picture. Too, too often um, people are just scribbling these comics and they're, they're not actually composing a picture. Every picture should be a picture. You should be able to take every picture in the comic out and it should be able to stand in its own right and tell the story. 
and therefore each each picture in the piece should contain the essence of the whole story. You should not just a fragment of the story. Here's an, here's another anecdote. I think I said this somewhere else recently as well. I was telling my little son, he was four or something. I was reading him a comic and it was a Batman comic. I was trying to read him those. Remember, they were trying to make a, a Batman adventures. They were trying to, back in the 90s. They were trying yeah. to make a version of Batman that was intelligible to children. Well, I've got news for them. It wasn't. He said to me, he's, he's pointing at the picture of a, of a Sunday shooting a gun. Look at this. Sunday shooting a gun. And, and he said, who's he shooting at, Dad? And I said, He's shooting at this man over here in another picture. And he said, my son said, he said, why is he shooting a man in another picture? <laughs> it's, it's like, couldn't he find anybody in this picture to shoot? You know, why is he shooting a man in that other picture? The, the whole, this whole fragmenting of, of the narrative, narrative into bits of pictures it was just confusing to the child. But, but they were trying to sell this. They were trying to sell a version of Batman that was legible to children. And, and, it, and it wasn't working. You know, there, there were people whose bodies were cut, cut off at funny angles. As I, and my son would say, where's his, where's his legs? Yeah, that's funny. So, yeah. so when, this is something we've been wrestling with for, you know, the, the, we worried about it for a long time. I don't know if it still applies because I don't care anymore. But we worried for a long time that the audience for comics was shrinking. And it, my argument was it's our own stupid fault because we've so developed comics that they're unintelligible, except to us, except to who've read them our whole lives. They're so complicated. It's difficult to introduce another person who hasn't been reading them all their lives. You know, one of those well brought up people who doesn't know mm -hmm. whether to read the pictures of the words first, they look at a modern comic and they go, oh, gee, oh Jesus Christ. They, it's unintelligible, it's a muddle, it's a mess. It's, all these fragments of things. They, it, it, they, can't see, they can't see something recognizable. They can't see somebody standing there because everybody's cut off at the, cut off at the knees or something. It's interesting because I've seen uh, I've seen a syllabus for for a comics class, and one of the things they pointed out was that if you show a person a picture of the sun, you know, up here, and then the next picture is the sun down here, yeah. like some people will say, "Oh, that's a setting sun," but then some yeah. people will say that is a sun at noon and a sun at five p.m., which is just they just see it as completely separate pictures. They don't see it sequentially. And I don't know if that's a neurological right. thing. Yep. If you drew one picture with everybody in it and the sun at the top, and then do the next picture with everybody in it and the sun at the top, they'll know exactly what's going on. They can read that. But it's, it's this way we do it. And there's another thing where, where, which makes it so difficult to read. Like I was, I was reading on some book about how to make comics. Um, so, because everybody made a comic thinks they know how to make it and they think I'll, I'll, do, I'll now do a book about how to draw comics, how to make comics and it said comics is a nested system. You draw everything in one panel and then move to the next panel. Not necessarily it's because so, so so the pictures here stay right? Yeah. Say this frame that I'm in um, and this is what people in comics do all the time. Say, so we'll put the first word balloon up here, right? We'll put the first one, and then we'll put the next one down here, uh, there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, you've got the reader reading downwards. The next place they're going to go is underneath. Is underneath. You don't, that's want, them, true. You don't want them to go underneath. You want, you want them to go over there to the next panel to the right. Yeah. To the right of your reading Western comics. To the left. To the, to the right. Oh. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to work out. Because <laughs> it's right. mirrored. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 
Right. We got that. So, so what you do, what you got to do to lead them that way, you put the first balloon there, then you put the next balloon here, they're reading across, the eye's going to go to the next one. The eye's always going to go to the next balloon. It's not going to go to the next panel. So if you go there and then there, and you want the reader to come down to another balloon over here, they're not going to. They're going to go to the next nearest balloon, which is probably in the next panel over that way. Is this making sense? I, I, it absolutely makes sense. You know, back in I back, a, I drew a picture in hell. <laughs> but anyway, good. No, I mean back in college, like so. I'm just going to tell a story I, now. So. The last time I did this, I tried to do it over the phone, and I was getting no. At least I got a little picture to work with here. You know, <laughs> with the balloons. You know, that way. So, so back in college, I was tasked to make a, a comic for incoming freshmen. Um, yeah. And the concept that my friend and I came up with was we'd use back the backgrounds of the school. So, you know, kind of just to take people on a tour and then we'd superimpose the cartoon figures on top of it. But that way people get to see the school and they get to see the story. But one of the problems that we had was that the, the hill that we came down on, uh, it went from, it went, see now it's, see now I'm doing it. Uh, it went from the upper left to the lower right. Right. So, and we're like, well, we, right. we need to have the, the, the characters go from up the hill to down the hill, but they're going from left to right. So how do we do this? And the only thing we could think of was we guide them with the balloons because otherwise they're going to go from, I don't know. I, don't, I yeah. have no idea where they would have gone. It's so counterintuitive. Yeah. So in moving, we've got very technical here. I don't, I don't know if that's what people want, but whatever, but it's okay. The way to move, the way to move the person around the page, is with the word balloons. So, I always draw the word balloons before I draw any figures. The first really? thing I put on the page is the word balloons. Well, you write a lot for yourself too, so you know exactly what words are going in there. Right? I have an idea. I have an idea. I have put a word balloon. I've left space. I've got a big figure here, but the figure has to fit in the space. No, you don't make a word balloon fit into a space. Because the letters have all got to be a certain size. So you've got to put the word balloon in first. Put all the word balloons on the page first or in the whole comic first. And then think about the pictures. So when you're doing one of those things where <laughs> we are getting technical, I love this. Um, when you are doing one of those things where you're doing nine panels of roughly the same size, the same picture, and you're, you, you have dialogue um, you know, you're changing yeah. the gestures, you have dialogue. How do you account for the possibility that the word balloons are going to be in different sizes based on the volume no. of so, speech? The word balloons at first, the word balloons are always along the tops of the pictures, because as I said a minute ago, if you take the leader down to the bottom, they're going to they're gonna start wandering down the page instead of left to right. Yeah, I have a feeling this is going to be inverted when, we, when I look at this later, and that's going to be left to right. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> people can deal. But Use your somebody, imagination, viewers. Somebody will, be, somebody will be saying years from now, I followed Eddie Campbell's theory and everything's back to front. I don't understand why. I, don't understand I followed Eddie I'm, Campbell's instructions I went, and I ended up making manga. <laughs> um, anyway, so there are a limited number of words. I, I have a rule that the word balloon on one of those panels should never should never come down further than one third of a way hmm. which with my size of lettering is usually about six lines so if i have more than six lines and another balloon to get in there somebody else is speaking either the whole thing is going to continue to another panel or i've got to whittle those six those 12 lines down to six mm -hmm. it's got to be six lines so if some, but see, working with somebody like Alan Moore, Alan Moore knew this. Alan Moore knows this. So he would never write too many words for one panel. In From Hell, you never get, you never suddenly get a panel that's overburdened with words. When you're writing for yourself, do you even still write a script or do you just go straight? I write, to it, on the... The page. I write it in the margins on the page and then I'll move the penciled words into, or I'm on the train. I write, I write it on a scrap of paper on the train, but no, it, it, I never write a full script. 
So you you basically go uh, straight to paper, straight to the paper. You still work on paper? You probably still work on. Paper. You're assuming that I'm still working. I'm a lazy. <laughs> I assume you're still drawing every now and then. No, I, I haven't been drawing for a while. The last thing I did was coloring from hell, and I spent two years on that. Really? Even to relax? What? Even to relax, you don't draw? Oh, drawing's not relaxing. I don't know. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. The last time I drew was a, was was a Christmas card for somebody last two months, <laughs> last month. Uh, and and I. And it felt it was terrible. I thought, this is shit. I'm, I've got to give this up. This is terrible. Okay. Okay. I understand. I'm becoming more, I'm becoming more of a perfectionist as I get older. I can't, um, I can't accept anything that I do. It's, it's, it's all unacceptable. Really? I, I don't. Oh, the last, the last book I did that I was happy with was the one I did with Audrey um Bizarre, bizarre romance. Have you yeah. seen that one? I've seen bizarre romance. Yeah, that was the last large body of drawing that I did. Published two years ago. I'll probably ask you about that later if we have time, because I'd like to know what it's like Great to work time. with certain collaborators. Okay. Um, and uh, you work on a lot of auto bio. You work on a lot of auto, of auto bio comics. Um, Not recently. But what was that? What was the learning I've got, experience? I've got, a new that, like, like, I've got a new idea, but I, I, I haven't got around to doing anything about it. It's, I've got the title. Mm -hmm. The title is The Second Fake Death of Eddie Campbell by Eddie Campbell. What would, what would it be about? The, <laughs> the author's name is part of the title. That would say, well, well, did you ever see a book I did called The Fate of the Artist? That was my first yeah. fake day. So this, this, is, this is my second fake day. So somebody thought I should do another book like that. Somebody thought, why that, that was your best book. Why don't you do another one like that? And once people make these suggestions, the, the, subconscious, the subconscious mind starts to work on it. Against all your, your better judgment, your, you start working out sequences. So I've got characters, and, but that's all I'm telling you at the moment. As well. But that's the title. I love it. I love how uh, somebody just plants a seed in your mind, and then you start <laughs> you start working on it without you even wanting to work on it. Yeah, yeah. You you, you wake up in the night and you, you, you you're working out scenes. And you say, wait a minute, I never intended to do anything about this. Why am I thinking about it? Uh, so with with uh, with the stuff like Alec and and all that, what did, what did, what do you think? What did you learn from it as an artist and as a storyteller? With that, uh, with the stuff, Alec. Yeah, Alec. Which is my most important. Which is my my most significant work. The work I want to be remembered by. What did I learn from it? And what were the challenges to and in, in producing something I so think personal? That, what I learned from that that I would take to somewhere else. The thing is, I never take I never take what I learned from one thing to another thing. I learned nothing from From Hell that serves me in any, in any of in any of my other works. Like for instance, I despise I loathe and despise horror. And really, people keep trying to get me involved in horror. That's horror. Good grief! No. Leave me out. I want nothing to do with it. I'm, I'm not interested. But you did it so well. I think, I think it worked because I hate horror. I think From Hell works because it's not, it's not the work of somebody who enjoys making horror. It's the, it's the work of the opposite. It's the work of somebody. I, I enjoyed the first pages, hundred. I enjoyed the first hundred pages because nothing happens in the first, nothing horrible happens in the first hundred, but actually nothing happens. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of driving around in coaches and walking up and down streets and sitting in pubs, sitting in old English pubs and things. And somehow, somehow or other, the dialogue uh, builds the story and you think, oh my God, this is, this is terrifying and horrifying. But all the time I'm drawing it, like one of my favorite scenes is on the ship, it's on a ship crossing the English Channel. Mm -hmm. 
And if you ask me my favorite page in all of From Hell, I'd, I'd say that page where they're on the ship that, that ends with, with, a, with a viewpoint from high up in the sky, looking, looking down past the, the flying seagulls. Yeah. But, but it's so sunny and cheerful and happy. It's so subtle too. Because um, I've been quite a f- all, yeah yeah. The rest of the book's all ugly and horrible, but I'm in I'm in quite a few um, I'm quite a few Facebook groups where From Hell gets brought up, and every time they ask what your favorite page is, what you know what if, what <laughs> when some of these people's favorite page is from is from Hell, there's a very common answer. Do you want to guess what it is? No. Tell it, me. It's the one where uh, Gull sees the gods on top of the mountain. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it's that splash page. I, f- I feel you are underwhelmed by this. I like the sex page. I like that sex page on, in chapter one, which, which is the most comical sex scene I've ever drawn. It's, it's, extreme, it's, extreme, it's extremely humorous. As sex should be. Lots of sex scenes in the book are humorous. Okay. <laughs> Lots of sex scenes in the book are humorous. I think there should be a rule that sex should be funny. <laughs> it it should be because like it is a it is kind of, it is messy. Like a lot of the sex scenes that you have in From Hell is like, well, no, 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 do it this way. <laughs> and so people clambering over each other. To get ouch! Them. Yeah, ouch! So there's something real about this. I, I enjoyed those as well. I enjoyed the sex scenes. They, uh, we had to be, I think Alan was deliberately being funny with them and um, I enjoyed drawing those. They, 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 yeah, I liked them. Although very often, very often in, in drawing a comic, whether it's one that somebody else has written or, um, or Alan or whoever, once, once I start, once I start drawing it, I'm, I'm not really interested in this, like, who did what. Yeah, it's like if you try to involve me in arguments about the, the, the Ripper theories, the, mm-hmm. the whole Masonic cover-up, I can't remember. I, I was only half paying, I was only <laughs> half paying attention to that at the time, because this this may seem odd, but because more and more, when, when people talk about comics, they just want they talk about the story on on these groups and whatever. What was your favorite scene? Oh, the this, the scene where Sonso does what, blah, blah blah blah, whatever. And it seems to me also that even the even the deeply serious and academic comics criticism is is these days only interested in what's happening. It's who did what to whom? It's, it's like the art of making comics has fallen by the wayside. Nobody talks about the things that I think about when I make a page. And when, when, I, when, you, when I make a page, I get the important story things on first. But from then on, I'm not thinking of the story. I, I'm thinking about design things. I'm thinking about... I had, I had to look at one of my books recently, one of the, one of the Alec books, and... I, I, just, I had to find a page to just to check on something, and I looked at the page and I thought, "Oh, what, what a nice, what a nice page!" And I was pleased the way the, on the one page and the page facing it, the, the light seemed to ripple in yeah. in a in an almost dancing kind of way across the two pages. It, just a, a ripple of light and lightness, a lightness of touch, and uh, there, was, there was a springiness to it. And these are abstract. The, and they're the kind of thing I think about once once I get the story out the way this has got to happen this has got to be he's got to be here th- that, that these people have got to be there he's talking to them they've got to come next so the, the word balloons in the right place once all that organization is out of the way I'm thinking about abstractions I'm thinking about the way I'm thinking about a way a coat hangs I'm thinking about the way a person moves inside a coat I'm, I want this to be the best coat that ever was drawn. A lot of the time it might just be a black silhouette, you know, the way I draw a coat, but but I want there to be a, a sense that there's a there's a human being 
moving inside this black silhouette. And, uh, his movements are only vaguely discernible because it's a big blocky shaped coat, but you're still, you're still nevertheless convinced that there is a person moving in there. Little, you know what I mean? Yeah. Little things like that are what interests me once I get down to drawing it. And, and I'm not thinking about the story. I'm not thinking about what this person's got to do, what he's already done, what he's got to do next. That's not what, that's never ever what's on my mind when I'm doing it. I'm not thinking about the Masonic cover up and from hell. I'm thinking about the way uh, a, a figure sits on top of a coach or the way he might, while he's up there, the way he might pull his collar up against the, the driving rain or whatever. Actually, I had, I had Gull driving on top of the coach through the rain. I wear, I wear hats a lot when I go out. Because have, have living in Australia for 29 years, you don't go out without a hat. Yeah. You know, you get burned. You get burned. I, where, I, where you are too, probably. You get burned if you go out without a hat. And the once or twice in my life where I've been caught in the rain with a nice hat, that's it. The hat's ruined. You have to, yeah. That hat's only good for wearing when you're doing the gardening from then on. You've, you've got to buy a new one. The rain destroys a nice hat. So I had, I had Gull wearing that, because remember from here, that I was drawing this 30 years ago. So I'm drawing Gull in, in the driving rain with his uh, felt hat. Didn't like it. it. It's like when you see the in town, you know, in, in, in London, if, in London, the Jewish guys who wear the gorgeous hats they wear, you know, those gorgeous hats that the Jewish guys wear, those, those black felt hats. But when it rains, they, they put it in a bag, they put it in a, black, a bag. And very often they put it in these supermarket, they slip it inside a supermarket carrier bag, get, tidy it up so it's airtight and put it back on the head. But it's always those orange Sainsbury's supermarket plastic bags. They're bright, bright orange. And the Jewish, the Jewish guys are walking around in the rain with these bright orange. <laughs> Here's the thing about about From Hell, because you're talking about um, you know the the process <laughs> and what you you know what you were thinking while you were doing it. I'm just gonna tell you. And you were talking about academics. I'm just gonna tell you this. I took one graphic novel course in college. And uh, one of the books that was given to us was From Hell. Yeah. Uh, but I had at that point already read it twice because I unfortunately have the edition um, with a movie cover. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's what was out at the time. So, um, <laughs> but... the, the bookstore distribution would only take a certain number um, if the movie poster was on the cover really? and that was the movie poster before they put Johnny Depp and Heather Graham on, on the post on the poster mm -hmm. that yeah. was the poster they had available but the, the the distributor to the bookstores I, I printed 30 30,000 copies of it of a 30,000 copies of a of a $35 book that's, that's a huge volume of, that's a huge volume of 600 page books but yeah yeah but sorry it, you just reminded me it, i hadn't seen that cover in a long time but that that's the story of why that's on there it it uh the, the what do you have to do when you're a publisher i can't believe i used to be a publisher i can't believe you did yeah i had the attention span to pay attention to that bullshit arguing with people of it what's going to Somebody else telling me what's got to be on the cover of my book. Retailers and uh, and figuring out what the what the readers would buy, that kind of thing. Is it a hassle? Just being a publisher, yeah. Yeah. There's this whole argument at the moment uh, on uh, on the internet about illustrators getting their credit on book covers and on Amazon, mainly on Amazon, mm -hmm. because. And I don't know how much 
headway they're making in getting things changed. But Amazon was only was only ever fixed up to show the author of the book, and they don't count the illustrator of a graphic novel as the author. Like I'm sure if you go to yeah, it's true. Even like the From Hell color edition of the color edition of From Hell, which I entirely put together myself, but but uh, author Alan Moore, <laughs> there's no mention. Of yeah, uh, it it happens all the time. Like the first person build Eddie, is the writer, and then it just Eddie Campbell's just the illustrator. Like what it should. What it should be is is co-authors, the, in which the writer is a co-author and the artist, yes, is is the other is the 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 other co-author. But when I was a publisher, I'd have happily taken my name. <laughs> I knew there was one name that was selling this this bugger, and that was Alan's name. If if they'd said to me, "We'll order thirty thousand copies if you take your name off it," I'd say. Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, sure. If you order 30 copies, 30,000 copies, I'll happily take my name off the whole thing. <laughs> well, what's, what is it like working with, with Alan? Because I, I got to say, like, when we got to From Hell in the class, all of a sudden I looked like a magnificent, intelligent god because I knew exactly what I was talking about. But it's only because I had read it like twice at that point. <laughs> I was going to, as a, a follow-up, Alan Moore, but as a follow-up, well, follow-up to what I was just saying. Yeah. Way back in the day, there was um, some comic artist who, who was ghosting for a very famous comic artist, uh, and he was asked how he felt about his name not being on it, and he said, "I don't care as long as my name's on the check." But Alan Moore. They who, do you do you remember who that is? Do you want can you not say who it was? Yeah. I can't remember his name. Okay. I'll only, I'll only make a terrible display of my god awful memory for detail. But Alan Moore, <laughs> what's it like working with Alan Moore? Was that it? Yeah, what was it like working with Alan Moore? My two my two most frequently asked questions. My two most frequently asked questions. So one, like working for Alan Moore and one, what's he like? Is one, that yeah. where do you, one, where do you get your ideas? Two, how mad is Alan Moore? <laughs> I try not to ask that first one to people because I know it drives it drives you creative types nuts. No, Alan, Alan, in in in, in his, his um, Alan has said it's the only, it's really the only question worth asking. Where do ideas come from? Really, it's a profound and profoundly interesting idea. And that led him to come up with the idea of idea space. Mm -hmm. Now idea space is a, is a place where we visit in our dreams and nightmares and reveries. And we go to idea space and we bring back from it according to our merits our, our worth so that one, one man might hear the kettle boiling and visit idea space and have the idea of inventing the steam engine and another man might hear the kettle boiling, boiling and have the idea that he fancies a cup of tea so that I can't remember. I can't remember where Alan wrote. Actually, I think that was my interview with Alan. I I did a long interview with Alan about his magic uh, investigations, and it's in a book. It's in here, titled "A Disease of A Disease of Language." My other my other Alan Moore book, which which I think is a much better book than From Hell. That is that is a, a, I was gonna... a book, that is a book of which I am magnificently proud. I was going to ask. I'm so much happier with that book than I am with From Hell. It's almost totally illegible. It, it's, why um, is that? Why is that? I've heard you say that before. Why is that? Why it's illegible? No. Why? Why? Why do you like it better than From Hell? Oh, why do I like it better? Yeah. I. Oh, because I feel that I put so much more of myself into it. Um. 
Alan created these monologues. They're, they're virtually pure poetry, um, which he had released on DVD, on CDs. Yeah. Each one was about, he went, each one, each, they're readings. And I think each one was about 70 minutes long. I think he did about five of these readings altogether. It was um, the birth call, snakes and ladders. Um, there was one about Blake. There was um, one about the moon and the serpent. Anyway, uh, yeah. yeah, I can't remember. I think I think there were five of them, which which I detail in the in the art in the the it's a thirty two page interview in which yeah. I I get Alan to talk about all these things, but with them. Um, I picked, I, I picked up the, the CD. I think I was visiting Alan and he gave it to me, the CD of The Birth Call. And I thought it was the best thing he'd ever written at, the profoundest, most valuable, uh, philosophically, um, just, just as a human document. It was the most valuable thing he had ever written. Um, and I said to Alan, I'd like to try and adapt that into a book, into a comic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you want to call, call it that. And he said, is it illustratable? And I said, let me do you a couple of pages. And if you agree it's illustratable, let me do the whole thing, say, as a, as a 48 page book. And I, I did a couple of pages and he said, yes. This, Wow, he said, let's let's go with it. And um, he was really happy with it. He thought that if he was ever to do a, a, a autobiographical pictorial book, that, that would be it. He he himself appears in it briefly, although it's I, I try to make it clear that he's uh, he's talking about the generality of of us, of uh, life in the the second half of the twentieth century. Much of it is very English. I, 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 you know, I, I, I don't know if an American reader will identify with it, but we we don't always. Oh, as I've forgotten who said it. Often we read a book not for it to be a mirror, but for it to be a door. Mm. Fran Leibowitz, Fran Leibowitz said, mm. we don't want to see ourselves, we don't always want to see ourselves reflected back. Sometimes we want to go through a door into another life and learn how things are lived in another place and another time, eh, in another universe, in Alan Moore's head. <laughs> <laughs> mm. well, so, uh, yeah, what's he, what's he like? <laughs> oh, no, Alan's... Um, Alan's definitely, Alan's a one-off. Mm -hmm. Alan's, a, Alan's a, a genius. I'm, have you read his uh, Jerusalem? I'm reading his Jerusalem at the moment. It's a, it's a wonderful book. I, ha I don't have a copy yet, the, the bookstore. Stuff has shut down in terms of... Oh, yeah, in the last, in the last year. Yeah. Um, often... I have read Voice of the Fire, so... Yeah, it's... Uh, He's, he's working a similar territory to that, um, except he's plowing it deeper. Uh, yeah, I saw that Jerusalem was much thicker, and I was like, maybe I'll get it later. It's a, <laughs> it's a, hell, it's a hell of a book. Um, sometimes with an Alan Moore thing, you can see that he's, you can see where he's picked up uh, things. He's picked up things from hither and yon, but he still sews it together in a completely original way. Yeah. Like he's, he's with Watchmen for some, you know, the ending to Watchmen was uh, was kind of inspired by... Um, it's from a sci-fi show from the 50s. Like the sci-fi TV show, yeah. which whose name, of, whose name I've forgotten. Yeah. Um, I forgot what it was called. And I've seen the... Which made me years later go and look at the actual half hour episode. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting, but watch me into the work of genius. <laughs> so he, he may pick these, and also the characters were all 
kind of originally characters from the, the Charlton books or whatever, but they're not that anymore. Yeah. In fact, as he himself said, when he sent in his plan for what he wanted to do with them, they, they recoiled in horror. <laughs> We've just paid a lot of money for these characters. We can't do that to them. <laughs> Wait, how how about you just give all your characters new names? You know? So Captain Atom became Dr. Manhattan and so on and so forth. And I've heard people say it, it can't be that the great graphic novel because He's, he's just used other people's comic book characters. It's just, but it doesn't matter where where it doesn't matter where the stuffs come from, you know. What you what you can do something with it that just takes it into another realm of, of utter genius. Yeah, uh, when I hear people saying, when I hear his distract his detractor saying like, "Oh, those are just the Charlton characters," I'm like, they're really not the Charlton characters. <laughs> That's just where they started. They're really yeah. not. They're completely different. Or Sundays. Or as they say, it can be. It can be a graphic novel. It was ten. Com- it was twelve comic books. You know, stuff. <laughs> so arbitrary. <laughs> so what arbitrary. Is, what is being? What is it? What is it now? You know, this can't be a work of genius. It was. It was a comic book. <laughs> it was drawn by someone else. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it's got superheroes in it. But you know that's a, that's an interesting well, thing because well, hmm? that's an interesting thing because um, when when I get into these uh, discussions and I you know people ask about like what the greatest Alan Moore comic is a lot of the superhero fans will always point to Watchmen but like the Alan Moore fans who are not necessarily superhero fans they have one answer they always have one answer I'm sure you can guess what that is because I'm talking to you. <laughs> It's, it's from hell. It's always from hell. Yeah. All right. The, are you, well, I drew it. I think it's a load of rubbish. You know? <laughs> I can't look at it with. I can't. The, the reason why I did the color edition is that for after it's twenty years since we finished it, and every time I look at it, all, all I can see is oh fucking! I, all I can see is what's wrong with it, and. I realize that puts me in a class of one, maybe. I don't know. No, a lot of you artists say the same thing. <laughs> Will I ever get the chance to fix this? When when they said to me, um, what can we do for the 20th anniversary? How can we do something special? Blah, 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 blah. blah. I, said, I said, let me completely redo it as a color. <laughs> I'm going to turn it into a color edition. <laughs> It's, it's it's a noir book. You can't make a cast. Let me. I said, let me do two pages, and if you like what I've done, we'll. <laughs> so I did two. This is my technique. Let me do two pages. So I did two pages, and they said, okay, then you've you've talked us into it. How long will it take? I said, two years. Well, it's then, a very long book. <laughs> it's a very working, big book. Working every day, it took me two years to get through it. So as I'm asking you if I, if I draw, uh, there's a few uh, pictures in there that are redraw. Well, there's so many fixings and corrections and um, from simple things like there was one page where Aberlene is arriving home and he's gone through the front door of his house, you know, to, to where his wife is standing holding yeah. the door open. But after he's gone through, I thought, and I don't know how I never noticed it before because I only noticed it when I when I when I'm coloring it, and I thought once he's inside, the hinges of the door are on the wrong side. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> notices that stuff though. We comic so do this all the time. You know, it's like it's like doing six fingers on the hand. You know, or putting th- put, putting the thumb on the wrong side of a fist. We do that at least once a day. <laughs> Do you know um, the uh, the first cover to the first issue of Avengers that Jack Kirby drew where they're fighting Loki? Thor's hand is the wrong way. <laughs> I, th- I think it's the wrong way. I remember like looking at it. I was like, that's that's the wrong. I think his left hand is on his right or something. <laughs> I'm not sure. I can't really blame the guy. He was drawing like 100 pages a month or something. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my pal, my pal Ed, Ed Hill. I'm living in Australia, so Ed, my pal Ed Hillier, who who drew the whole second volume of, of no, the 
Bacchus has 10 parts. He drew yeah. the second part and also the fourth part. But he did an illustration for the, the Sunday magazine of the independent newspaper. It was a, a lovely color illustration. It was a girl underwater and her legs are kind of twisted together. <laughs> She's kind of, her legs are twisted together. <laughs> And at the bottom of this, she's got two left feet. <laughs> <She's two laughs> left. And I thought, I thought, shall I email them and be the first to tell them? But a week's gone past because I'm in Australia. Somebody must have told them. By the time I got my printed copy, somebody must have told them by now. All that, all that detail, all that effort, and then, and then the feet are are the same. <laughs> and a fellow artist always laughs the hardest because we, we all do it. <laughs> but this time it was you. It was you, Eddie Campbell. You stupid. <sighs> yeah, I, made, I, I, made a, I made a half hour film about the colouring of From Hell. But yeah. I noticed as the evening wears on, there's a, when it's full screen, I notice a real graininess. Yeah, the, way, the, way these, the way these cameras work, they, they catch it, but they, they can catch things in bad light. The image is just the image is, the image is just grainy. You know, it's amazing what these things do. Uh, how much research did you do on From Hell? Uh, you know, because you had that you know, you were talking about that whole chapter where a girl is driving around London. Did you? Well, well see, well I was in Australia at the time. Yeah. And uh, on the, on the chapter where he's driving around, Alan sent me. 64 color photographs which he took on a tour around around london which uh, jamie delano was the the driver on the on that tour and i think alan's wife somebody else was with them but but i got i got when i was doing the Becker's comic i i got uh, jamie jamie uh, delano he'd written something for a spanish magazine, a Spanish publication, a fan publication about driving Alan Moore um, around. And uh, I, got, I got the original English before they translated it. I said, can you send me the English of that? I'll talk to Jamie. I won't use it without. And I, I got in touch with Jamie. I says, can I use that in Bacchus? He says, yeah, yeah, go ahead. But yeah, it was about the day. I can't remember which issue it was in, but it's never been reprinted elsewhere ex ex except in Spain and my thing, I think. Who knows? But um, it, it was a little article, uh, three or four pages of comic book text. And I threw in a couple of pictures of, of the photographs in, in black and white that they'd taken, that Jamie had taken of Alan. Alan would sometimes stand beside, uh, like like on the, on the port, to call it the portico, the, the portal, the, the doorway, <laughs> whatever, it's, whatever it's called in, in swell talk. <laughs> yeah. The door, he's standing in front of the door of Christchurch Spitalfields to give me a sense of the scale, um, things like that. But anyway, he sent me 64 of those pictures, plus the entire uh Thames and Hudson book on on the architects the two architect whose names I've suddenly forgotten about the, the one who did St Paul's and the one who did um, Christchurch Spitalfield anyway thick thick books color pictures everything that that he sent that with the reference with the script how many writers send that much reference with a script because I came as a big package. Um, Did you go through all of it? Oh yeah, I used I used everything that could be used. Yeah. I even used one I shouldn't have used because he 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 kind of told me not to use it. I didn't know why he told me not to use it. It was only later when my daughter was living living opposite this pub. I, I stood close in front of it and I realized the date was one year. <laughs> It was 1893 or something. It was it was just wasn't there at the time. <laughs> Then why did he send it? He just thought it was a great picture. He's maybe <laughs> taken it. So I went and used it. It's still in it's still in there. I think it's called the Queen Mary or the Queen Adelaide or something. I can't remember. That's funny. Um it, it's it's funny but, to me. Yeah. But when I was doing the color book, there was one photo Alan didn't get and 
this was pre, this was 1990, this was 1990. It was pre-internet, pre-Google. Um, I think you could, I think you could ask Jeeves or something, I can't remember. <laughs> but there wasn't that great reser, reservoir of images that you've got now in, 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 on the internet. Yeah. So I, I wasn't able to draw Bedlam, the favorite, the madhouse, Bedlam, the madhouse. And I drew it from inside the gate. Alan suggested drawn from inside the gates with the with 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 the big padlock, with the padlock and chain on it, which was still an interesting image, but it was a kind of melodramatic image that I didn't really want in From Hell. I wished I hadn't done it. Mm -hmm. So when I I was now able to find a photo and replace that image with with a much more pede pedestrian one of the building with, with huge dark clouds rising up, rising up, rising up behind the building. Um, and the thing is, it's now much more in keeping with the style of the book, whereas there was a picture there before that wasn't. So, so that, was, that, was, that was one time recently where I had to draw a picture. I had to draw the building and I had to draw Galen Netley in, in front of it. Yes. Um, but but there are many there are many places in the, the color from hell where I've completely re redrawn a panel, or I've gone and found that Alan made a picture description which I didn't use, and I've gone back over it and I thought this is such a good picture description. Why did I screw about and not do it exactly the way you said? You know when felt, you're doing felt right at the time. You like five thousand pictures in there that you know every now and then. I've done it my way. And um, anyway, this was one instance where it went back. There's one where um, Marie Kelly has just realized that uh, her, her, two of her friends have been murdered that day. And uh, uh, her, her boyfriend, he, he puts his hands on, on her, you know, her up from standing behind her and she clutches his hands. But I just, did not do it properly the first time. This time I've got I've got her nails digging in, and there's a real feeling of anguish in the picture that wasn't there before. Um, so you were asking, you know, what, these are probably these are the last times I, I did I did I did drawing, which was to fix drawings. But I had to completely draw a pair of hands. I had to take out the hands up there and completely draw a, hair, a pair of hands that were as expressive as interesting and interesting as Alan requested in the first place and i i don't know why i didn't do them exactly so this is you being a perfectionist have you seen, have you seen, have you seen the color one it's uh, yeah i've seen the color one and um, yeah. there's there are a few diehards like you that still think the old black and white one's better and i'm not going to get i'm not going to get into an argument about it but the car the color one is the cat's pajamas. It's the dog's bollocks. It's the, it's a better book. <laughs> you know what else? The color one's existence does not remove the black and white one's existence. People, they can no, you can have one, the other, or both. You've got a choice. But yeah. on the new one, I've designed lovely end paper. It's a card cover. I've designed lovely end papers. Mm -hmm. The whole design of it is a, is a, a pleasing package. And uh, as somebody who vocally does not like horror, when you come to the scene where uh, where Gull is cutting up Mary well, Kelly, funny you should mention that because um, what were you going to say? Were you going to ask a? Yeah, I was going to ask how did you feel while you were drawing oh, and coloring yeah, that. I thought I thought I won't answer the question in my head just in case he asked an easier one. I'll better check. <laughs> was that was that the question in your head? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, now, as you know, with with the um, we we put them out as as parts. We put it out as ten parts. And when I looked at the when I looked at the parts, I I and, and maybe this is why you should <laughs> you shouldn't buy the parts. When I looked at the parts, I thought. I underplayed the horror because I, I horror get, horror is overdone. Horror is, is always overdone. I, I so underplayed the horror. When I looked at these pages, 
I, I thought to myself, I've had nosebleeds with more red than, than there is on this page or this page or this page. So I went in and I put much more red on it. So the, the, that scene has got much more red in the, uh, in fact, there was so much red, I, uh, I, I sent it to Chris Staros, my editor, and I said, yeah. have I gone too far? Is, <laughs> This is a this because is a section of a human being. I'm I'm not sure there is a too far. If you've ever had a nosebleed, it goes everywhere. <laughs> your, your whole handkerchief, the front of your shirt is, is you know, you haven't been cut open. If somebody was cut open, all the room, the the, the wallpaper, every, the the walls, the floor would be red. And um, I thought so I've got I've got to get back over this. This once more. And when I did it the first time, I always had the excuses. This is, it's not real horror. It's just black ink. I, you know, I always told myself, this is black ink. I'm not really, I'm not really cutting up a human being. Yeah. This is not me doing this. I'm, That's how I'm you nice. distance yourself from it. I'm a nice man. I, I, I wouldn't do things like that. You know, I, <laughs> it's just ink. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised that you talk. It's a genuinely awful and horrendous scene. And, but it's, it's, surely it's sickening. Surely at this stage it's just sickening. It's, you know? Or is. No? no? Do people, do people look at this and like it? And, oh, God, well, I hope not. That Eddie Campbell, he's a sick bastard. <laughs> it's, did he pull this out of his head? I mean, there sure are like there sure are some some people, um, you know, some fans who like to think that uh, the work that you do was reflective of who you are. And I'm like, I don't really think that's necessarily true for most people. Um, I don't think Garth Ennis goes around <laughs> killing a bunch of people all at once. Um, I know what you mean, but I think, I think we reveal ourselves by accident in so many of these things. Um, and that's why yeah, comic books are interesting. A Jack Kirby comic book is interesting, no matter who wrote it. Yeah. Because Jack Kirby is telling us about Jack Kirby. Doesn't matter who wrote it. Um, who else is like that? I... Jack Kirby comic books have a lot of fighting, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, Jack Kirby probably knew how to fight yeah. really well. <laughs> Even as you're, <laughs> so he's the one guy drafted in World War II who was actually on the front lines. Yeah, I've got one of my favorite of his romance comics is this is a is about I can't remember the title is of it. So and so, her name was a she tiger, <laughs> and, and the splash table. She's she's raking this guy's face with with her fingernails. It's this is violent scene. It, it's the splash page of one of his romance comics. I can never be able to find it again. But I had it on my desktop for ages. I'd show it to people. And so look at this. <laughs> That's a Jack Kirby romance comic, <laughs> and and it's it's about how she. She tames herself and she becomes civilized. And it's like she, she had a foul temper and she couldn't stop from expressing her feelings. <laughs> expressing her feelings. <laughs> See, women are like that. Women express their feelings. Somebody tweeted the other day. She, she said, "Men yell when they sneeze." I always do that. I, I yell, I go, ah, but you've got to time that exactly with the sneeze so that it wakes up everybody in the house. But somebody on Twitter says that men do this because that's how they express their emotions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got some conversations with some female friends sometimes where they're like, What's up with guys and the and the guy hug? 
<laughs> you know, where you just take somebody's hand and you pat them twice on the back. I was like, I don't know. That's how guys hug. <laughs> Yeah, because when you're doing it, the other guys are always saying, okay, that's enough. That'll do. <laughs> <laughs> don't start to like, don't get into it. <laughs> I don't make the rules. <laughs> um, I remember hugging my dad because you don't, my dad was a, an old style Scotsman. He didn't, he didn't hug. Uh, but I'm glad I hugged him once or twice before, before he died. I remember hugging, I could, I could, I can feel him stiff, stiffening, into, <laughs> stiffening in disgust. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. There, 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 son. You better get your, you better get your train now. It's coming in now. Don't miss your train. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me and my brother, like you know, me and my uh, brother are like really close. But every time we see each other, we're just like, that's it. <laughs> that's how we greet yeah. each other. Yeah. The young gener, the young generation, <laughs> and their feelings. No, they get no sentiment. <laughs> Learn to shout when you sneeze. <laughs> Bottle up all your emotions in that sneeze. <laughs> um, I heard that you actually volunteered to continue big numbers. Is that true? Once, twenty-five years ago. Is is that? Did so it's you beyond? It's beyond 20, 98, maybe, 98, 23, two, 22 years ago. Well, um, was, why, would, why, why would you volunteer well, for something so it, insane? Alan thinks of it as a, a, it's a, it's a work of its time. Yeah. It's not, it's a work of 1990. It's not, it's a work that he, it's a work that represented his, um, thinking in 1990 and the world as it was in 1990. It was originally going to be called the Mendel. It the was Mendel so brought it. hip at the beginning. It was so uh, in front of its time. It was in front of its time. <laughs> it wasn't ahead of its time. It was, it was in it front was, of its time. It was in front of its time. <laughs> it, was so, it was so in front of its time that Alan got a call from from Benoit Mandelbrot and he's <laughs> and Mandelbrot said can you take my name off it please <laughs> he said I'm having a hard enough time being accepted by the intellectual community if I have my name on a comic book it's going to screw everything up so, so Alan said oh I completely understand and he changed the title to big numbers it's crazy, but why? Why? What was it about big numbers that that made you volunteer to continue it? Like, did I just, you just want really to see like... it finished. Because, oh, yeah, in '98 I had finished from hell. That's why it's nine. I've just remembered. That's why it's got to be '98 because I finished from hell. It's from three hell years was... after you I... finished Bacchus too. The last, part, the last part came out in '98. The Dance of the Girl Catchers came out in '98. It's also like the uh, three years after you have already finished Bacchus. I think I didn't finish. I finished back at about ninety-eight as well. Yeah. Okay. So you were freed up a bit, looking I was for free to do something new. And what I ended up doing was the birth call and snakes and ladders. Mm -hmm. I may have. I may have been after I'd done them. I can't remember. But I, I said to Alan, two two artists that had, had already flamed out on this thing, you know." Fallen out of the sky like Icarus on his on his melted wings, <laughs> both both Icarus and Icarus's dad. Who I've forgotten the name of Icarus's dad because they Daedalus. Both, Daedalus, yeah. yeah. They were both up there in the in the <laughs> both Daedalus and Icarus had had burned out and crashed into the sea on this project, and um, and by 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 those names I mean Bill Sinkevich. And Al Columbia. And Al Columbia. Yeah. Both of whom I spoke to, both of whom I contacted and got emails for when I did The Fate of the Artist. Uh huh. I, have you read that? I have read some of it like a long time ago. I don't have a copy did, of my own. Because I did the story of big numbers and why mm -hmm. big numbers failed. And I, I was, I was, <laughs> I was, 
furiously sarcastic and satirical. <laughs> um, like Bill, Bill came up to me years later and he said, he said, Eddie, I thought you were a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Bill, I am a friend. Here, let me, let me buy you a drink. What you have you? He, I said, have a whiskey. And he, he picked the most expensive whiskey on the menu. <laughs> he probably said it with that big smile on his face, too. And we had, and we had a drink and we, <laughs> we got over my, I think, I think we got over my intransigence, my intransigence in, in being so bitterly satirical about the, about the whole thing. When I look back on it, I, I shake my head and I can't, I can't believe how I could have, how did I write? When I showed it to Diana Schutz, who was my publisher at Dark Horse for many years, Diana Schutz, Dark Horse editor. Oh, she was staying with us. Because it was 2000, she was, she, she was, she was doing a, a comic convention in Australia. She stayed at our house. But, um, I showed her this and she read it and she said, you can't print this. You can't publish. You can't publish this. Because <laughs> um, Bill had, um, Bill had, um, he, he, he had a girlfriend and he was, and he was seeing another girl and and the, so the story went. And I, knew, I was only getting it third. <laughs> but I didn't want to name these girls or, or draw them as, as they actually look. So I drew them as Betty and Veronica. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought that would get me into less trouble. <laughs> There's, and there's no comics more, more litigious than the Archie Cole. <laughs> <The> Archie Cole. <laughs> but, but I must have been flying so far under the radar because they never said anything. <laughs> the, story, the story is in the, the Alec omnibus for anybody who's, anybody who's listening to this baloney <laughs> is tempted to, go, tempted to go and have a look. <laughs> Did, uh, uh, we've been here for an hour and a half, but I wanted to get to I go. Think, I think the back cover, the back cover of the original publication of, of how to be, that was how to be an artist was that book. It was called the, the, the I can't, I can't, the back cover blurb went something like it's, it, it's this, it's the story of wannabe artists and half-wit millionaires. <laughs> Or something. <laughs> or something like that. I can't, I can't remember. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah. I interrupt. Half yeah. an hour and a half. We've been here an hour and a half. I wanted to get and to the go. That's why I fact, when I went and fixed the lights was probably about five o'clock because I know <laughs> that's what the... I wanted to get to the goat getters. Um, oh, the goat getters. Yeah. Very, very We should talk about some of my books. <laughs> The, the goat gators did you have a question i can jump off from or shall i yeah i wanted to ask what was the impetus behind uh, behind that book I've, i know you've been I've, working on it for a very long time fascinated with the sports page cartoon and the artists of the sports pages um for like 30 35 years i kept a file on it and the, 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 it was a ring binder but it's kind of like that now it's it's like a ring binder <laughs> It's it's so full of stuff, but um, so I'd already kind of organized the book. I knew who the major players in this story were going to be, and and the sports page cartoon is is interesting from more than one point. One one point about it is that it's an interesting formal thing that, as far as I know, doesn't exist anywhere. Where they draw this very serious rendition of the athlete but then draw little scribbly 
piss takes or, or mockeries. Yeah. <laughs> mockeries. Are, like around it. Even, yeah, around around the serious figure. It may be a, a picture of his, it may be a, a realistic portrait of his head. It may be a full figure of him in action, boxing, running, doing what the athlete does. But around, but so it combines this realistic drawing with his secondary facetious big headed scribbly drawings were or big foot it's usually big foot style they draw they draw him as they draw the, the guy as a clown they draw him as a complete clown and an idiot at the same time as they draw this gorgeous figure of his athletic prowess but it was the uh, the dynamic between that the two things that made the sports cartoon very very interesting but then the other point of the sports cartoon was that they started throwing in these irrelevant things. And the sports cartoons were like Ted Dorgan, George Harriman, mm -hmm. Rube Goldberg, <laughs> Jimmy Swinnerton. You know, people, with, people who, who, who were important in the beginnings of uh, the comic strip. But this is the reason why they are. They started drawing in these funny little characters. In the, they might draw a little square. <laughs> We've got little, the continuing story of some stupid little little bunk the dog or Harriman had um, had another thing, whatever. But the, these little antics suddenly took over the thing, and it, and and it turned into the daily comic strip. This is where the daily comic strip begins, like Matt and Jeff, for instance. Um, Silk Hat Harry's divorce suit. And the interesting thing about these comics is that they're not in the, the color pages, which is like the, the supplement you give to the children. Yeah. They're on the sports page, which is read by the adult male. So they could be a bit risque. They could be, they could be a bit gambling and cheating on your wife. <laughs> Shit like that. And they're, they're kind of very rough. They're extreme, wait, wasting all the, the, the household money on betting, you know? They're making fun of stuff like that, which you don't get in the kiddie funnies. So there's this, 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 this is why it interested me. It's um, this multifarious aspect of the sports page cartoon. And, and they, they invented their own slang, which is where goat getters come from, to get somebody's goat. Oh, we get slang it. Slang phrase that came out of the sports cartoons. And all of the sports cartoons, when they got somebody's goat, they draw the, they draw a little picture of the goat running away <laughs> or jumping out of the person, <laughs> or somebody would be carrying the goat away under his. I've got his goat. I've got it under my arm. I'm, I'm walking away with it, and the goat always had a little tag on its tail saying whose goat it was. You know, like Eddie's goat. It's uh, it's interesting. It's like a, a time capsule, right? Of it's a great, but the whole thing is just a great story. So so if you read the Goat Getters, you're reading it. It's a, it's a, it's an enormous piece of Eddie Campbell tomfoolery. It's me being a, a serious scholar of the history of art, but it's really just a great story. It's a great story of, uh, of tomfoolery and buffoonery and, and cartoons. Uh, uh, there's five hundred cartoons or parts of cartoons which I have, um, I have restored from old newsprint. Or, sometimes from microfilm if I couldn't find it on newsprint. I think it was an important cartoon that had to be in there. How do you restore something for microfilm? How do I restore it? Well, yeah, if you've like, ever seen microfilm, it, it looks like shit. Yeah, it's like it, this tiny, so. Well, if you can blow it up, but it's, it's the problem is- I think it's is, grainy, right? The problem is that it's just never kept well. The original, some of the later ones they've made are in better quality, but, but from the most, the, they did the most important papers first. So, um, uh, you know, the, the big city papers, mm -hmm. and they haven't, they've, they've not kept as well as the ones they did later when they'd worked the, chemi the, the chemical balance out a bit better for, for making the film permanent. Uh, some of the later ones, you know, like, so, so that the New York wor world is in, is in a terrible state. Yeah, it's just fuzzy. So much of it is out of focus. But some rural paper from bumfuck Idaho is, is in perfect condition because they only did it five years ago or something. And, and, 
But very often, you know, a lot of the great cartoons were reprinted in some rural paper. So I can get a get better copy of it and drop it into the original, um, the original typographical setting of the, the big city paper. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do a bit of that. Sometimes I'll use three different versions of a cartoon to get one good restoration, things like that. It's a lot of work. I worked hard on that book. That's <laughs> I notice uh, it does not involve you drawing. Does it? No. Yeah. Because you don't draw anymore. <laughs> as, I get, as I get older, I've become, and many people will be surprised to learn this. I've become less self obsessed and I'm prepared to spend a much greater time um, resurrecting and restoring the, the, the work of older cartoonists who I think are much better and more important than me. And as I say, there, there are people wa watching this who would be extremely shocked to hear me say that. Like my ex-wife, for instance, was like, what? He's, he said, what? He's matured. <laughs> <laughs> the old fella's maturing or something. <laughs> That's not the self-obsessed bastard I lived with for 29 years, she'll probably say if she watches it. <laughs> That's the thing, right? Like, I, 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 um, I was, because of the internet, I can read things that I wrote like 10, 15 years ago. And I'm like, wow, I was a, I was an angry person. <laughs> and uh, why did I think comics should cater specifically to me? It's like, they don't have to. Good I don't care. You. Good for you. Um, and uh, with the goat getters, get the sneezing thing right, and you'll be mature. <laughs> uh, we, we, you'll, be, you'll be fully matured. I'll be fully matured in thirty years. <laughs> but uh, with the goat getters, I was I was wondering. Um, so there was a sports cartoon that was very similar to editorial cartoons at the time. Yeah, I hasten to say I'm not interested in sport. Some people are going to say, well, I don't really want to read this book because I'm not interested in sports. Well, neither neither I, I don't care. <laughs> it, it was a formal kind of, no, but it's not like, it's not like the editorial cartoons, which are a completely different thing and involve caricature and all kinds of allegorical ideas. And the sports cartoon has its own rules and it's completely different. Is, is completely different from the from the editorial cartoon as it is from the comic strip. Although, as I say, it, it later amalgamates in a way with the comic strip. Although the, the, the sports cartoon still existed. It still existed right up, at least until the 50s and probably after that, as far as I know. I was looking at the sports cartoons of Oh, I've forgotten his name. I better, I better not go in there. I'll only make it worse with my bad memory. But anyway. You, you've mentioned a few oh, names. Also, yeah. And also, we've got to mention the other book. Bizarre Romance, yeah. which, which, which I made with um, Audrey, my, my, my dear, dear wife, Audrey Niffenegger. I have a question for you. Who's the writer? Who, of, who among the two of you is more famous? Well, I'll t tell you, she and I, we're having dinner in a restaurant with Chris Ware and somebody from the other side of the restaurant came over with a with an, an autograph, a pad or something to get an autograph. There's me, Audrey and Chris Ware. And I was thinking, who do, who do they want? This will be interesting. But it was Audrey that they, it was Audrey that they wanted. They wanted. They, they had no idea who, who were Chris Ware and Chris Ware and Eddie Campbell. We were. Yeah. We, were nobody. we were nobody's. Audrey wrote The Time Traveler's Wife, which yeah. was turned into a movie, and she's currently writing a sequel of The Time Traveler's Wife. But Bizarre Romance was, uh, I turned her, her short stories into comics. It's a, it's a nice little hardback book. Um, and it, 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 there, there, are, there are several interesting female protagonists in it, which is interesting for me because 
I, I've never really drawn free mind. It was the channel. That was the channel. See, that was the abstraction. Yeah, I say there's always a book. What's what's the abstract thing in in this particular book? The abstract thing in this particular book was to to come up with a number of female protagonists who are convincing and interesting and deep uh, human beings, each for different, completely different reasons. Because I'd I'd never really done this before. Because in comics, there's yeah. there's only two women. You know, there's, there's absolutely. Mary Jane, there's Mary Jane and and Gwen Stacy and Aunt May. No, no, no. Gwen Stacy's just a version of Mary Jane. There's Mary Jane and Aunt May. So, so I thought, I'd, what a challenge to come up with half a dozen, you know, six or seven interesting female people. Each one is completely different. Each one is completely different from the others, and each one is a a challenge to a comic book guy like me it's uh so even back then uh, even as recently as bizarre romance you have um you know you have learning experiences yes yeah thing yeah yeah and, and i tried to make each each of her stories seem to demand uh, seem to me to demand a, a different approach a different look once I'd started in doing two or three like that, I thought, well, all of them must. <laughs> Let's see if I can give a different look to all of them. So that they almost look like they're drawn by 13 different people. <laughs> different people. That's impressive, though. Right? That's impressive. Well, I hope so. That became the challenge. Did, uh, there's, yeah. There's one of them, for instance, that where I've rendered in which was the last time I really worked hard as an artist. I've rendered in gouache where I've, it's a story about Edward Mybridge's favorite model where, where I've, I've drawn photographic pictures in, in grays, in painted grays, including one, including one of the, the, the lady, the girl, the, 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 the nude girl getting out of bed in 36 pictures. Yeah. It was one of the most challenging things I've ever set myself. See, once I, once I said that, I'd, I'd forgotten what the story was. I guess I, just, I have to get this. I spent weeks on that, on that two-page spread. On sequences, on details. Yeah. Okay. So it's funny because you keep talking about how you have a bad memory for detail, but when it comes to detail in your storytelling. Yeah, yeah. And, and he never actually, the thing was, in other places in the story, I've copied his photographs diligently. But on that final two page spread, there was there wasn't one to copy, because she no, another girl got out of bed. It wasn't this one. In in her original uh, uh, story, Audrey had named the uh, the Blanche Epler had named the model, who was mm -hmm. a beautiful blonde haired model, very classical in her, in her proportions, and. Except, and the story followed her, except that she's not the one who got, she's not the one who got got out of bed. There was another model who got out of bed, but I thought I'll ignore all that. I'll have Blanche Epler get out of bed, which means I had to completely draw it from scratch with a, without photos to to work from. And I thought, right, this could be the. I must make. I want to make this look photographic, but it's not copied from photographs. This could be the biggest challenge of uh, my career as an artist. Like, yeah, that was the, I think I may have been the last time I totally lost myself in, in a couple of pages, weeks I spent on that. I know they're completely different projects, but can you talk to me about what the collaboration process, how it's different between, between Alan and Audrey and Neil Gaiman? Well, with Audrey's book, as I say, I took the stories and mm -hmm. I turned them into wouldn't it be with, similar to what you did with the birth call though? Because it was already Yeah. It was like it was the birth call with the model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the same with Neil, because Neil had written it. Oh, the 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 truth is a cave in the Black Mountain. Is it that the one you're referring to? The, the book the book I did with Neil. I was actually thinking of the spirit story that you did, but yeah, okay. We did a whole 80 page book yeah. together uh, just five, six years ago, called yeah. The Truth is a Cave in the Black Mountain. Um which was originally commissioned. I think he'd written a story, but I don't. I don't think it had been published yet. But he was commissioned to 
narrate a story at the Sydney Opera House. This was for the graphic festival. The whole idea of it was to turn comics, graphics into a live weekend, a weekend of live events. So Neil would read this from the podium on the stage at the Sydney Opera House on the opera stage, the, the, the prestigious uh, event. My, I was to paint a number of pictures that would be, that were to be projected behind him in a huge screen behind him while he stood there. The, the whole thing is being illustrated behind him. And foreplay, the string quartet, and they're not a classical string quartet, they're kind of a rock and roll string quartet with violin, viola, and, but they've got the, the wah-wah pedals and the, the buzz pedals and the buzz and all that. They, they, they provided the music. They, they, this was a 70 minute thing with continuous music for 70 minutes, which, which, they, which they wrote, they invented for the event. Imagine that. It's incredible. It was a great event. We, when the so I took oh, we we did it we did it again in Tasmania for a festival down there. This was when you were still living in Australia. Yeah, I'm still okay. living in Australia. Um, and now when we, I I took the whole lot and I and I turned it into a book. So Neil wrote the story, but I took it I took everything with the pictures. I I just made I made it work as a book. It's it's a beautiful little color book. If find it, I did. the truth is a cave in the Black Mountain. It's about 80 pages. And to promote, <laughs> slobbering, to promote the book, what we did was we took it on the road. Mm. We took the show on the road. We did it in San Francisco. We did it at Carnegie Hall in New York. We did it, in, we did it twice in London. I've forgotten I've forgotten the name of the theatre in London and one once in Edinburgh. Uh, and, and at each stop we we signed a squillion. We signed a squillion. <laughs> it, it's like when Neil when Neil's got a book signing, it's like we'll sign a we'll sign a you know, we're on the road. We we have to finish our breakfast quickly at the hotel and run down to sign a thousand books. Sign a thousand books. <laughs> 2,000 books. It's like awesome. I do my own books. With, with the whole print run is to, it was like we're signing like the whole print run of one of what would normally be one of my books. <laughs> but uh, um, it, there were problems in different ways. Like um, on the on the Carnegie Hall one, the, the 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 picture on the wall was too small. Yeah. You know, it kind of, this, this could have, this was possibly our most prestigious Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Uh, appearance. And, um, but it was going to cost us an extra 30,000 bucks uh, to, 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 for them to get different projection, projectionist projection equipment. And because they're totally, they're totally run by the, the unions there, mm -hmm. you know, the, it was going to be all these different union fees to get bigger pictures on the wall. Anywhere else to say, they'd be saying, how can, how can we help? How can we make this better? <laughs> Carnegie Hall, the union runs the thing, so it cost a bloody fortune. But anyway, um, we used to, we used to, <laughs> I'll kind of stand up, I'll get cramp in my leg. Hold on. But we used to finish the thing. In the story, the story takes place in this kind of fairy tale Scotland. It was, this fairy tale Scotland in the 1700s, um, approximately, it would be like if you imagine a, an alternative Scotland. So the, the two main characters were Celts, and um, where they, at, at the first stop, Audrey and I walked over all over San Francisco to see if I could buy a kill. <laughs> See if I could buy, I could buy, buy a kill. Even better if I could get it in the Campbell Tartan. But, but, but being, being American, found a great old Scottish shop with kilts. And yeah, the only kilts I could get for, were for guys with 42 inch waists. You know, it's, it's, it's America. Guys for 42 inch waists. When I needed really, what I needed was 34. 
Although I confess I'm, I'm a 36 now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what living in America in a pandemic will do to you. Anyway, so the only kill I could find was uh, uh, a, an army camouflage, army camouflage, an army camouflage kilt. <laughs> so, so the, now, at the, when we did this at the opera house, we had that we, we started. We had this thing where I, I come out, and at the end of the show, because Neil said we should get you on stage, Eddie, for for ten minutes. <laughs> So I came out and we did 15 minutes where I give Neil a, do an interview with Neil and I, I gave him a hard time over some of the things about the story. And um, uh, and we did that, we did that at the end of Tasmania as well. So we were gonna, so I had it all planned. I thought he won't see it until I, I went, I walk on stage where, <laughs> where wearing the, the camouflage kilt <laughs> and, a t and a t shirt. I thought I've changed to go in, to go on at the end, and um, and he turned around. And he's, he saw me and he said, "What the fuck, McTartan, is that?" <laughs> <laughs> and and we, we started off there. But anyways, each show would end with fifteen minutes of me, me and uh, and and Neil doing a bit of repartee, ba badinage as he as he got. Healthy badinage would give each other a hard time. Anyway, do you? There must, uh, be, there must be an hour, two hours. <laughs> no, this is great. There must be two hours. Anyway, so that was my book with Neil. It's a great, it's a great eighty-page book with Neil. It's, it's a little square book. It's, yeah. it's almost the same size as those little golden books used to be, but thicker, and and it's full, it's full color from from wall to wall to wall. I I don't know. What, they wanted to turn it into a, you know, you know when, you, when you do the books, they, they, they say, we, now we do the, audio, now we'll do the, what do you call it? The, the Kindle version. Yeah. And I thought, how can you, you can't, you just got to photograph it. You Kindle. Know, yeah. You can't turn this into a Kindle version. It's just no. a, it's a wall to wall. It was because, because the original pictures were painted pictures and, and I, I kind of linked them all together with little comic sequences. Uh, for, for each time we, for, for, the, for the time we did it before, before the second time, and then for the time to make the book work, and so when we did the, when we did the final film show, there were like a hundred, hundred pictures going on, behind behind Neil, so that it, each one is not up there for very long. When he's if he's on there for seventy minutes, you know, a picture is not up there for a minute. There's one picture, which is very painful, and it stays up there for a painfully long time. It, you know, it, 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 it's the Right at the apex of the story, which is, Did, which is a painful moment in the story. I thought you were going to say it was painful because you hate looking at your own work. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> there is that. I do hate looking at that one because I did a, I did a beta version. I said, well, when we could reprint this, can we put this in? But I don't know if they ever got it in. Um, my, my, in my work without where when they redo it, where when they change it at least. Uh, so that was the you know. I, I, everything I can't look at anything I've done you let me fix it so I've become happier and happier with the my, the digital file of, of, of my book because at least I can change it in my head I've fixed it yeah I can't I can't keep it in my memory we've got to the next time we print this we're going to fix 10 things 10 things must you remember <laughs> what is it with, isn't that what the troll says as you go over the three three things must you know <laughs> 10 things must you fix <laughs> that's that's the perfectionist in you though that's the perfectionist in you yeah you want to fix it what is I uh, other people's stuff if i see other people's stuff I, you're gonna have to fix that yeah. <laughs> that's funny because a lot of artists are like they see a lot of other people's stuff and they're like oh man my stuff isn't as good but you're like oh no you gotta fix that <laughs> <laughs> I have a dear friend, a dear young friend who's brilliant. He, Landis Blair, he, his, his book, his book, um, his book um, just won a prize at the, at the Angoulême Festival in France. It won the, the graphic novel prize for the year. So it's called the, the, the Hunting Excellence. It's a great book. It's a wonderful book. 
but he's he's the cross hatchman. He's the cross hatchman. <laughs> when he showed me his work at once, and I said, I said, the, the amount of work, the amount of time you've spent cross hatching this, you could have learned how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it didn't destroy him. He, he, he laughed. Wait, I've got it. I'll cramp him. I really should wrap up so you can, so you can these, get rid of that cramp. Of these, but, but he laughs about it now. And he didn't, he didn't walk out in a sulk. He didn't. It was in a bar and he didn't walk. He didn't walk out in a sulk. But anyway, the hunting eggs are the magnificent work. If you, in case you want me to re recommend something from the current scene, what are the young folks doing? That's, there's one. There's one. It's a, I reckon. It's a nice signal boost. My last question is: What is the Midwest school? Oh, I've got a book about that. I've got a book about that, but it's nowhere near done. There's there's a particular Midwest sense of humor. There's a Midwest. There's a Midwest style in the comics. You know, like I described, uh, I said, I, like I said, this is how comics worked in the sports page. Well, in the Midwest, they, they created a, a style of comic, comic, which I call the panel comic. It's one picture. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in this picture, there'll be 10 people talking and it's all word balloons. So it's not the same thing as a gag cartoon, which is one line underneath. Yeah. You know? Like it's Family like, Circus. It's, it's not like Family Circus. Yeah. It's not, it's not like that. It's not like the cartoons in the New York. This, it's one picture, but, but, you know, Claire Briggs was the, he was a guy, or um, Webster, I've forgotten Webster's name, first name. Uh, there, there was a few different artists, but, but, but they all did this style and they, they were into nostalgia and, and their humor was never an attack on somebody or even a type of person. Their, hum, their humor was always just laughing about, about life. So look, this is life, we can all laugh about it. Yeah. It's, it's a great style. It's a lovely warm style. But um, oh, Frank King is one of the midway, you know, with, who, with Frank um, King, Gasoline Alley. Of Gasoline Alley. He's, yeah. he's one of, the, one of the, the top four or five of the Midwest artists. But Gasoline Alley started as a panel comic, you know, just one really? panel. Again. The, the four or five guys fixing a car, and each one of them's got a balloon with. <laughs> 20 or 50 words in it. His word balloons, his word balloons would take over the thing. I love his uh I love his Sundays. I love gasoline yeah. alley Sundays. Sundays, yeah. yeah. And, but no, but that's how if that was the daily one. On the Sundays, you do a big color comic, which is more like you know everybody else's comics. But that was the Midwest style. The Midwest style was just the, the panel comic. They used to call it a panel comic. Mm -hmm. Nowadays we say can't be a comic if it's not got sequential <laughs> i should get you in i should get you in the same call as scott mcleod and <laughs> he and i used to argue in forums all the time i i, I think the last time we did it, it was about 98 or 99 we, they, they, these forums would go on like for hundreds and <laughs> there'd be other people and it'd be me and scott scott mcleod tearing each other's ears off argue, arguing <laughs> What a comic is. What idiots we were. Well, I feel like the whole thing where, where that he says where it's got to be sequential, I feel like that's just for the sake of ease of, uh, of talking about comics and the gutters and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 understanding comics is a great work, but, but I, see it as, I, I see it as a great graphic novel. I think it's a great work of fiction. <laughs> And and because he's in it himself, it, it you would classify it as autobiographical fiction. It's a work <laughs> of autobiographical fiction. I I have a copy. It's it's a good book. Is it is it the basic I, definition of a comic that you disagree I with? I file it with my I file it with with my books. It's, <laughs> it's next to Ali because it's autobi autobiographical Ethical fiction. <laughs> Is it is it the basic definition of a comic that you disagree with, or? I'm not going into a fight with it. Scott's a wonderful guy. Scott's yeah. a wonderful little chap. Whenever we'll see him and his wife, we we express we we exchange joyful pleasantries and we have breakfast together. Whatever it it um it's it, it, that, I'm trying to remember the last time it was it was this was in Sydney. I think the last time we sat down for breakfast. 
but it was maybe 10 or 12 years ago or something like that. Because there's people I only ever know from breakfast, the breakfast room at conventions. Yeah. All around the world. Um, I consider them dear and lovable friends. And I've only ever seen them three times in my life for, for breakfast. Maybe I met them in the elevator once or something. But, but the, community, the community of comics is... So, so what you're really saying, Mr. Eddie Campbell, is that is that Scott McCloud should grant me an interview? Is oh yeah, <laughs> speak speak to this. I, I, I hope I'm pointing the right way. Speak. It might be this side. Speak, <laughs> speak to this man, Scott. It's, he spoke to me for two hours. I mean, he's got it down to fifty minutes, but it was originally two hours. I'll probably keep the whole thing, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, you. I'm going to let you go. I feel like you need to stand up and say. stretch. That's what we say in the Midwest. We say, I'm going to have to let you go now. Yeah, because I think, I think you got to stand up and stretch your legs. Somebody who's hogging the air. I've, I've sat here so long. I've got cramp in my, cramp in my legs. So thank you so much, Mr. Eddie Campbell. I hope we can do this again sometime. Maybe. Uh... It's, that Jose, it's that Jose. He done it to me. <laughs> I hope we can do this again sometime. It was great two hours. I love talking. Thank you so much.